Everybody. My name is Scott Graham. I'm an extension entomologist at Auburn University and with Alabama Extension. And today I'm going to be uh, walking through scouting insects uh, in cotton. And one, one note I'd like to make before I get started is just to consider, you know, we're talking about across the entire cotton belt here in the U.S. Pest pressures uh, vary greatly. You know, what, what your, your key insect pests are vary as we move across the belt. So I'm trying to just kind of take a big picture a look at some of the main pests that we deal with uh, in general across the belt. Uh, one thing I'm, I'm not going to hit on much are thresholds. You know, those can vary uh, greatly between regions and between states. So I would recommend uh, that you consult your local extension uh, professionals to get thresholds for the different insect pests that you're, that you're uh, trying to make decisions on within your crop or, or your, uh, your farms. So with that, we'll We'll get into it. Um, uh, starting out, you know, it's very important to have the tools of the trade. So that goes from anything from, you know, water bottles of water to sunscreen and, and uh, you know, wide brim hat sun protection, but also things like uh, infestation reports uh, that you can uh, keep, keep organized to give to your farmer or, to, or whoever you're reporting to, as well as proper sampling and detection tools. So in cotton, uh, there are certain times of the year where sweet nets are very important to go out and, and sample and, and try to quantify insect pest populations. At other points in the season, we move to drop cloths and that becomes uh, one of the more important detection tools that we have to try to quantify insect populations. You also may need things like a hand lens, which can be used to see very, very small insects like uh, spider mites or uh, aphids to help with identification there. And sometimes you may need some kind of a handheld clicker when you're, you're counting high numbers of insects or if you're looking at uh, things like square retention and you're trying to keep several numbers straight in your head, sometimes it's easier to have a clicker to help you go through that as well. So again, very important. You know, we don't always think about these types of things, but it is important if, if you're going out to scout fields, sometimes you're somewhere where you don't have uh, cell phone service, for instance. So it's important uh, that you let people know where you're going, uh, let them know when you plan to, you should be back or at least back to where you have phone service. Uh, Cause you never know when, you know, you may run into, you know, things like snakes or, or some kind of sun poisoning or something like that. So it's important people know where you're going, that you have the proper uh, tools that you need to, to most effectively and safely manage uh, insects in, in cotton. So with that, we also need to have a plan. When, whenever we walk into a field, we need to have an idea of what insects we're dealing with, what insects are important at certain times of the season. So that way we're not distracted looking for, say, uh, stink bugs during the seedling stage. There's no developing seed in the field and the, there's no bowls in the field during the seedling stage. So stink bugs aren't an issue. That's when we need to be keying in on things like thrips, uh, slugs, snails, stuff like that. So it's important to have an idea of when you're in the field, what stage your crop is at, what insects you're susceptible to, and focus in your scouting efforts on that. But do keep in mind there are a lot of secondary pests in a cotton field. So it's important, you know, while we may have the idea of we're sampling for plant bugs today, it's important to be observing, looking for aphid populations, looking for spider, met, spider mite infestations. So that way you're, you're always paying attention. You know, we, we kind of tell folks in Alabama, you know, um, a cotton field is not a place for a, a cell phone. It's a place to really be looking and observing because it's, it's very important not to miss anything because you're distracted while you're in the field scouting. So I, I don't want to, I, I want to try to be uh, deliberate with this. I'm not going to go into every single uh, pest that we may observe in a, in a cotton field. I want to key in on the kind of the important ones. I do want to take just a second to mention what I call the stand robbers. So these are pests early season while we're trying to get the, the crop established. Things like grasshoppers, cutworms, uh, slugs and snails, which are not insects, but, but can cause uh, losses. So it's important prior to planting or, or you know, prior to 
seedling, seedling establishment to be out scouting, looking to see what insects are in the field. Some things to consider are production practices. So if you're in reduced tillage fields, no-till fields, uh, fields with cover crops, those are probably going to be more likely to have issues with uh, pre-plant or at-plant pests. So those are fields to key in on. You see the image there of the grasshoppers. Those are really more of a problem in, in lighter, well-drained soils. Um, they emerge in the spring and, and they can hatch out over long periods of time. So you get in, in these no-till fields and you can have a lot of grasshoppers in that field. Uh, you, you see the, the uh, image right above the, the grasshoppers there where you see a, a plant that's been over and basically the grasshopper chewed that uh, main stem, wasn't able to quite get all the way through it, but it broke the plant over. Uh, called stand loss that way. You also see an image of a, a true army worm and a cut worm beside that. These are uh, pests that, you know, the, the army worms maybe are above ground feeding on things. A lot of times cut worms are just below the, the soil surface. So you got to scratch around a little bit. So that's just something to think about. If you're in a field with a lot of seedling cotton and you see plants that are clipped off, laid over or missing plants, Sometimes you can look around and find uh, the critter that did it on top of the ground. Sometimes you need to scratch that soil back a little bit and look. And that brings me to slugs and snails, which are a growing problem. Uh, you know, uh, snails you see on the left, they're easy to tell apart from slugs. Snails have shells, slugs do not. Uh, you know, for the most part, the snails that we're dealing with in the, in the U.S., they're not really doing uh, very much, if any, leaf feeding. Now, there are some that, that are feeding on leaves, but for the most part, they're not actually munching on the leaves. You see this image here of the, of the plant laid over, and that's kind of what we see with issues with snails, is that they just, the sheer number of them that crawl up on the plant, bend it over and break the plant off, and you lose it that way. Now, slugs are a little different. Slugs actually do cause uh, defoliation. They, they can chew on the plants. You see the the image in the top right corner there with the uh, the orange arrow pointing at the slug. And above that, that arrow, you see a cotton plant, and it's got these irregular kind of jagged uh, leaf feeding edges on the, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, on the uh, cotyledons there. And that's very characteristic of feeding that uh, slugs do. Now, unfortunately, there's not a lot of options for control uh, for slugs or snails. Uh, some baits are available for slugs that are, are somewhat effective, uh, but it's important to understand what, what we're planning into, you know, as, as the crop is starting to emerge, what pests are out there. So very important. And we, we've got to walk this crop at, at even, like I said, a week or so before planning to make sure we're not going into a, a tough situation to get the crop established. So once we do get the crop going, thrips are, are the number one uh, seedling pest of cotton. We know basically every acre of cotton across the entire U.S. is going to be infested with uh, thrips. Where I am in Alabama and in the southeast and mid-south, the tobacco thrips is the dominant uh, species, but there are other thrips that can be in there as well, such as western flower thrips, uh, onion thrips, soybean thrips, or a lot of different species that can be in the field. Now, they are very, very small. Uh, you see the image there uh, next to a 12-point a uh, font Roman numeral I, just to give you a scale of how small they are. Uh, can, can be difficult to see with the naked eye, but you can see them. Now, they have piercing and sucking or, or rasping and sucking mouth parts. And, and the way thrips feed, and this is important, is they actually prefer to be in the uh, leaf buds as they're pushing out. So... So when that, that uh, true leaf is, is still in the, in the terminal before it's expanded, that's when that thrips is doing the majority of the damage that it does to that plant. It's, uh, it's puncturing and, and sucking out the juices of individual uh, cells. And then when the, the cells that work damage grow around it, that's when you get this puckering uh, appearance. And, and sometimes it looks like the leaves are ripped and stuff where, where healthy cells are growing around the dead cells. Now, we don't always see directly attributable yield loss to this. It does, they, don't, they very rarely in commercial settings kill plants, but what we can see are situations with delayed maturity. And sometimes that week, 10 day delay can, can be pretty important for us. So it's, it's very important that we're out scouting, watching for thrips and, and prepared to uh, make treatments when necessary. 
Now here's an image uh, or a couple of images. You see one with, with essentially no thrips damage of a very, very healthy looking plant. And on the right, you see an image with, with uh, I would say maybe slightly more than moderate uh, injury, uh, unacceptable. If I saw this level of injury, I would uh, say a, a foliar application would be justified, but it, it can get worse. So you see this image here, and this is actually a seven or eight node plant that has just been heavily, heavily damaged by thrips. So this is a type of potential that they can do. Again, this is not very common in commercial settings just because this uh, is very rare to get an insecticide or get a uh, seed without an insecticide seed treatment or some form of app plant insecticide to go out with it. So this is actually a, a no insecticide at all on this cotton seed or in the furrow, completely unprotected plant. And you see uh, the damage that, that the thrips are able to do there. Or they, another thing to consider with thrips is not only are they causing injury above ground, but they're causing injury below ground as well. And this is kind of where we get some of this delayed maturity that we see is, as you can see on the image comparing the four uh, thrips plant of the, the four uh, seedlings there, the more stunted the above ground growth is, the below ground root growth uh, follows the same trend. And so if we're not getting off to a good fast start trying to get that tap root you know, growing down uh, quickly, that's when we run into issues later in the season that were actually a result of, of the delayed maturity or, or poor control of thrips early on. So how do we sample for thrips? Uh, a lot of different ways. To me, the easiest way is to take a a white styrofoam cup or a, a white Cool Whip container, something like that, go out and, and knock some plants, uh, uh, beat some plants around onto the white container, and then just simply look in and, and see how many thrips you have. Now, again, as I've mentioned, uh, thresholds really vary across uh, different uh, regions and states, so I'm not going to get into that, but, but do know you can see a, as small as they are if you get a good white uh, uh, container to look at them to, to really make them uh, like the, the contrasting colors obvious you can see them crawling around uh, moving around on, on that white container as small as they are now how long do we need to protect uh, cotton seedlings from thrips somewhere around the fourth to fifth true leaf stage in most cases uh, that gets the the crop with enough growth and the things particularly as as growing conditions tend to improve Really, uh, the cotton can just kind of outgrow any injury that thrips may do. When we get into uh, poor growing conditions, particularly cool temperatures and cool nighttime temperatures, the cotton's not growing as well. Although the thrips aren't as active and probably aren't doing as much damage, uh, the cotton is, is just not able to outgrow it at all. So we really see exacerbated uh, thrips injury in those situations. It is important to note the presence of immatures because that means whatever app plant insecticide was used uh, is failing. Um, those immature thrips have spent their entire life on, on that seedling. So they, you know, adults can move in from weedy hosts and, and uh, you know, ditch bakes and things and die. Uh, maybe we find them before they've ingested enough insecticide to die. But if we're running into a lot of, of immature thrips on the seedlings, that means our, our app plant treatments are not working. And again, just to kind of drive home the size of them, you see this, this zoomed up picture of a fully expanded true leaf, probably about the size of a quarter or so. You see all those orange circles, those are actually immature thrips on, on the underside of that leaf. So again, just to kind of give you the scale of, of, uh, of how small they are. And another thing to point out are those blue uh, rectangles you see there. That actually brings me to the next pest that I want to talk about, which are two spotted spider mites. So those are actually spider mites on the underside of that leaf with uh, all those immature thrips as well. So spider mites, historically, you know, when you read the literature on them, they began on ditch banks. Um, they were kind of a border pest that moved their way into fields. We're kind of starting to shift away from that now as more and more acres are going into reduced till, no till. Uh, certainly, as we start getting into more and more cover crops, we're starting to see uh, spider mites starting just randomly throughout fields. And what's happening is we're not getting good, uh, sufficient burn down early enough. So we've got what, what we call the green bridge, which is uh, living plant material there long enough for spider mites 
to go from uh, whatever that winter vegetation was to the seedling cotton as it's emerging. And then once we get there, uh, they're just kind of waiting on it to get hot and dry and they can really build numbers fast. You see on the slide there, they can go from egg to adult in as little as four to five days. So obviously you can get a lot of generations going really fast. Now the image on the left there is actually a, a picture of two, two spotted spider mites and, and three of their eggs as well. You'll note they're kind of a straw, uh, yellowish color with those two black dots on either side. So that's how you you identify the uh, the spider mite. Now it's it's not an insect. It's it's got a, um, but it, but it is a a pest that we deal with very consistently. And something else that we see a lot are what we call spider mite hot spots. So these are just kind of random spots throughout the field where they start and then they spread from there. So here's an image of of four different hot spots in the field in central Alabama a couple of years ago. Uh, you can see where it's a little bit lighter there where they've started defoliating this uh, this uh, seedling cotton as, as it's getting emerged. And so just to talk a little bit more, show some, some of this green bit bridge thing that I'm talking about. Here's an image of some cotton surrounded by, I believe it was cut leaf evening primrose, uh, which, which served as a host of uh, of spider mites. So this, I took this image one day. Uh, you, you can hopefully you can see the cotton plants in there with it. But after the application was made that those weeds started to die, you can see uh, in the bottom of this next picture, uh, the, the cotton plant there with the reddening of the leaves and it, it's starting to show spider mite symptomology. Um, so just to give an example, kind of some, some pictures of what that green bridge looks like. Now, as far as, as the damage, it, it kind of varies what you see. Uh, obviously, seedling plants are a lot much more prone to things like defoliation because they don't have as many leaves on them, right? So in very severe instances, we can actually see you know, complete defoliation and, and dead plants from spider mites. As the plants start to get some growth on them, that defoliation maybe isn't quite as common. It can still occur, but but generally we catch it before we get to that. What you see a lot of times is this reddening on the leaves, particularly along the uh, leaf veins and, and down the folds. It starts out as kind of a whitish, what we call a stippling. And then it, uh, as it, the severity uh, increases, it, it turns to a red and sometimes a dark purple color. And then leaves can and will eventually fall off the plant. So this tends to be worse in, in hot, dry conditions. Uh, not always, but but they seem to be more likely following uh, sequential uh, applications of broad spectrum insecticides. So when we knock out all the beneficial insects in the field, uh, we're not getting control of the spider mites with a lot of those products. And if it gets really hot and dry, they, they start doing that every four to five days, turning over a generation, and they can really get big on us quick. And one other thing to note about sampling for spider mites is they're feeding on the underside of the leaf. And so sometimes if, if you find a leaf that's got a lot of symptomology on top and you flip it over, you may look and not see any mites. Now that doesn't mean there's no spider mites in the, in the field or on that plant. Sometimes once they've essentially sucked that leaf dry, they just move up a node or two. And so they're on a leaf above that. So if you see a heavily uh, damaged leaf, you flip it over, there's no mites move up a leaf or two and, and uh, flip those leaves over and inspect them for mites. Sometimes they can be hard to see until they start moving. And a trick for that is to uh, point the leaf toward the sun. Uh, it kind of agitates them a little bit and, and makes them crawl around. And then once they start moving, they're really uh, a lot easier to find. So spider mites are a pest that, that seem to be becoming more and more of a problem. Uh, it's something that, that we can control, but we really need to be scouting and uh, observing for, even if these aren't driving our scouting programs, we need to be thinking about them and looking for them while we're in the field. Another pest kind of along those lines are uh, aphids. Now, these are, these are gonna be in, in most fields in most years at some level. Sometimes they blow up really big, sometimes they don't. Uh, you know, like, uh, like spider mites, they reproduce really fast and they actually, uh, Basically, they're, when they're born, they're already uh, mated. They have an asexual life cycle, so they can, they can start reproducing pretty quick after they're born. So they can really build up numbers fast. 
They're also pretty prone to developing resistance. As you can imagine, there's not a lot of genetic diversity in the field because uh, a lot of these insects are, are already uh, ready to reproduce before they're even born, essentially. So they can really uh, develop resistance. Now, some of them have wings, some of them are wingless. And, and basically as, as they start to realize, hey, you know, we're, we're sucking this plant dry, we need to spread, they can actually start producing forms with wings that can uh, disperse better across the field to go to uh, new plants. So here, here's a, kind of a zoomed in image of some aphids you see there. Some are, are a dark green color, some are more of a yellowish color, some are black with wings. Uh, you see some of the cast skins there as well. Uh, so they can look a lot of different ways, but regardless of their color, their size, wings or no wings, the, the giveaway for aphids are what we call cornicles or, or sometimes we refer to them as tailpipes. So these are, uh, these, with these two arrows are pointing here, these are kind of the key characteristic for aphids. This is actually where they secrete the honeydew, uh, which you may be familiar with. You see it on leaves. So aphids like uh, spider mites are fitting on the underside of the leaf. As they secrete this honeydew, it'll go down and uh, cover the, the leaf below it, which can kind of make it look uh, shiny or be a little sticky if you go out and touch it. Uh, that's a good indication of, hey, I need to be looking the leaf up to see what kind of aphid pressure I have if there's a lot of honeydew on the field. Now, one of the good things about aphids are they are uh, fairly susceptible to biological control. The aphid fungus comes in every year and, and generally crashes the population at some point. A lot of times we wish it would have come in a, a week to 10 days earlier than it did, but it's going to come in and, and knock out those populations they're also susceptible to, you see some what we call aphid mummies there that have been parasitized. Uh, and then, of course, things like ladybugs or lady beetles are, are also good predators of aphids as well. So very rarely do we see, you know, really uh, significant yield increases in small plot research trials from spraying aphids. But some, sometimes we do need to treat, particularly if the plants are already stressed by drought or something like that. Uh, where the, the plant's not growing as well, then you add that, uh, that stress from the aphids as well. We can see delays in maturity. In those situations, it, it would, would be uh, justified to treat. Another thing to consider is if there's so many aphids, it's hard to, you can do a drop cloth sample for plant bugs and there's just thousands of aphids. It's hard to pick out the plant bugs. Or if you're trying to look for escape bollworm, bollworm eggs, things like that. If there's just thousands of aphids, it's hard to find them uh, in those situations too. Um, but in the most part, as long as the plants aren't too drought stressed, we can typically wait on the aphid fungus to show up to, to take aphids out. So now we'll move to tarnished plant bugs. This is the, uh, the dominant insect pest in the Mid-South and is, is uh, growing in, in its severity in other parts of the cotton belt as well. So this insect in Alabama uh, begins primarily on daisy fleabane, but, but across the country, it, it begins on flowering weedy hosts, whatever they are, uh, uh, weeds in the spring. A female can lay anywhere from 50 to 150 eggs in her lifetime. Uh, those hatch in a week to 10 or 12 days, depending on environmental conditions. Similar to that, they go from, from the hatchling uh, to an adult. So they go all the way through their life cycle and uh, somewhere between 15 and 21 days. And about another seven days later, uh, they're able to start laying eggs. So you're turning over a new generation of plant bugs roughly once every 28 days or, or once every month, you're getting a new generation of plant bugs. So here's uh, uh, some images of, of the adult plant bug on the left and, and uh, immature plant bugs. On the other side, the adults are, uh, are more of kind of a tarnished brown or mottled brown color. Uh, the nymphs are anywhere from a, a very light green to a dark green as they mature through their stages. There are a couple of characteristics, particularly for the adults that make them easily identifiable. The first is, as you see this image here with the orange arrows pointing at those two white spots at the bottom of the wings. So that's a, uh, a key characteristic of tarnished plant bugs. Another would be that uh, triangle at the base of the, that right kind of below the thorax or the head there uh, is another characteristic. The immatures are, are similarly shaped. As I mentioned, they're either kind of a light green or a dark green as they go. 
as they age, they develop uh, wing pads, which you can see on this image here on the right. And then they also start to develop uh, black dots on their thorax and abdomen as well. So these are, are some of the key characteristics of, of how to identify these insects. As far as the damage that they do, uh, in uh, early season in cotton prior to bloom during the pinhead square stage, adults are infesting fields. They're feeding on these pinhead squares, which oftentimes results in uh, what we call square abscission or, or square loss. The, the squares fall off the plants. You see an image there of a dried square with the abscission scar right behind it on the on one image, the other image, you don't see the square dried up, but you do see where that scar is. And this is important to, to watch and monitor because uh, this is a way that we can see how much damage uh, infesting plant bugs are doing uh, in, in the field prior to bloom. And a lot, of, a lot of thresholds are based on either the presence of adults or uh, a percentage of square retention to try to maintain on the plant. Now, uh, a lot of people recommend monitoring square retention in the upper two or three nodes of the, uh, of the plant. I personally don't like to get into that terminal node where the, the very small developing uh, square is because sometimes when you're thumbing through with your thumbs, you might break that terminal off and that would do more damage to the plant than a plant bug would do. So I like to kind of focus on in this image here what I've got uh, marked as node one and two. Um, and part of why that is is a, a cotton plant's putting on a new node roughly every three or so days. So if I look at, at the upper two nodes, I, I'm seeing basically what's happened in the week since uh, I last sampled. So that, that's something to keep in mind there. And then you see the, again, images of uh, a missing square, a blasted square, or a flared square, which are all indications of, of injury from plant bugs. You also see the image there with the, the clicker. And so what a lot of people like to do is is go through and click every time they look at a, a, a square position and then keep in, in their head how many uh, squares were missing so that way they can keep up with what their percent square retention is. Now, as the crop uh, progresses and, and matures into the blooming window, this is really when plant bogs uh, become a little bit more of a challenge to control in particular. Uh, part of that is they prefer to feed on larger squares, which are the images that you see here. Uh, they're hidden inside of these bracts a lot of times, so getting good insecticide coverage can be difficult. But so what they're doing is they're, they're actually feeding uh, inside that square. So this, this will open up into a flower, and they're feeding inside the square, uh, targeting the developing anthers. And so you see some, some signs of feeding on the outside, those yellowish stains, stains we call those dirty blooms. And essentially that's where they're, while they're in there feeding, they're, they're kind of pooping and, and uh, dropping excrement and that stains the outside of that uh, bloom and, or that square. As the, the square develops and opens up into a flower, then it opens up, you see the signs of that uh, injury uh, on the bloom. Sometimes you'll see plant bugs inside of white blooms feeding as well. Uh, but a lot of this injury was actually done uh, during the square stage. And then as the, the flower opens up, you see a lot of the signs of, of that injury. Sometimes from that, we see these misshapen, uh, what we call hawkbill uh, bowls. So you start out with the square that's damaged. You're maybe you, you uh, the plant bug uh, kills some of those anthers on one side of the bowl. They don't pollinate properly. Then you get this misshapen a hawkbill bowl here. So uh, that's just something to, to think about and, and keep in mind. And really the most important way or the, the best way to sample for plant bugs while you can look at some of these damage symptoms is actually to take the black drop cloth. Uh, it samples two and a half row feet uh, on either side. So you're sampling five row feet total when you sample. Vigorously shake uh, the plants dislodge all the insects onto that black drop cloth and then you can count uh, the number that you have uh, per five row feet and then calculate that out to how many per acre if you want to but but most thresholds are based on an average count of uh, immature plant bugs per five row feet. Uh, something else I'll, I'll briefly mention is the clouded plant bug. This one uh, sometimes can, can be a factor, not always, uh, and a lot of times if it is, it's at lower numbers, but it's still important to be able to identify it. So the way we identify clouded plant bugs versus uh, tarnished plant bugs 
is a they're they're a little bit uh, more narrow shaping. They're a little bit larger, more robust. But the key characteristics are uh, you see these orange arrows pointing on both the adult and the immature. There are the uh, the the club joints at the uh, base of the antenna, and then the big uh, jointed uh, leg segment as well. There, so those are they have bigger legs, and and the big jointed antennae are the way to uh, to identify them compared to the tarnished plant bug. They're generally more prevalent in years following wet springs. Uh, that's that's believed to be because button bush is, is an important early season host, and it's more of a, a wet, uh, a, a plant that thrives in wet conditions. They can also turn over multiple generations per year. Again, not not as prevalent as tarnished plant bugs are, uh, but they, they are as damaging or more damaging. Part of that is They'll actually feed, as you see that image there, on uh, on small bowls uh, much more aggressively than tarnished plant bugs will. So that uh, th these are, are pests that it's not uncommon to see and that we should be able to identify. So now I'll, I'll move into bowl worms or uh, corn ear worms, uh, as they're also called. This is a pest that is has uh, previously been very very important. It went through a period of time when we first introduced BT. Uh, technologies where it was a single gene BTs, it was still important. The early introduction of our two gene BTs, it, it kind of uh, dropped in its uh, importance. It's starting to rise now as we're seeing more and more resistance to two gene uh, BTs. As the third gene has now come in, our, our VIP cottons, uh, it's, it's uh, not as commonly seen, but it is something that we still need to be able to scout for and monitor. You see the the image of the moth there on the left and, and on the right, you see actually uh, a large bowl worm eating a smaller bowl worm. So a uh, little, little biological control there, but you see you know, part of what sticks out in this image is they look completely different, right? They can be uh, very different colors. They're not always green. Uh, they're not always tan. They can sometimes be pink or kind of a yellowish color. Uh, the colors vary, but, but one of the key characteristics of bowl worms as you see, it's kind of got an orange or a, a, a tannish head capsule there, and then those alternating stripes along its body and, and some hairs uh, sticking off of it as well. It's not a, a very hairy caterpillar, but it, it does have some, some hairs uh, projecting off of its body. Here's a look of uh, some of the eggs. You see there are these white uh, uh, sphere round, round uh, uh, objects you see there. Those are bollworm eggs that can lay in the terminal. They can lay on squares, they can lay in blooms, they can lay, sometimes you'll find them on bloom tags. So you really need to be scouting and looking uh, out, particularly uh, depending on what BT technology you're scouting that day to know how important it is to look for uh, bollworm eggs, to be prepared to, to scout for escaped bollworms. As far as the damage they do, they can feed on squares, they can feed on blooms, they can feed on uh, terminals, they can feed on bowls. Uh, so they, they can do a lot of different damage in squares. A lot of times we'll see you know, holes chewed through where they've gone in and, and eaten the inside of that uh, developing square. Again, with bowls, a lot of times we'll see, sim or excuse me, with flowers, we'll see similarly where they'll they'll uh, eat all of, all of the anthers and, and uh, structures inside of the, the flower. And then with bowls, if, if they get in there early enough, they, they can completely hollow out a, a large bowl as well, eating those developing uh, a linen and, and seed inside the bowl. So it's important that we're scouting and looking. You see the image there on the left of that small uh, bowl worm that's been trying to nibble in, hasn't quite gotten his way in yet, but when he does, you see on the right what he can develop into and, and do. So important again that we're scouting and, and looking for bowl worm damage. You got to know your variety. As I mentioned, in, in some parts of the cotton belt, our two gene varieties are starting to see some slippage. Uh, you know, we're, we're routinely needing to treat them in some areas. Other areas, two gene cottons are still providing good control. Uh, three gene varieties are still providing very good control, but we do need to keep scouting and, and monitoring and, and uh, watching during our peak moth flights to ensure that we're not uh, overwhelming these technologies with numbers that they just can't uh, suppress. And then if you're if you're looking at non-BT cotton, you should be scouting it at least weekly, uh, looking for caterpillars and or their damage uh, to be prepared to, to make a recommendation. So the last insect I'll talk about is a stink bug. Uh, this is a, a somewhat new, new pest. Uh, it kind of started in the southeast. 
as we got into uh, boll weevil eradication and then BT cotton, uh, those kind of overlapped uh, the southeast. We went from a very uh, high spray environment to a much lower spray environment and stink bugs kind of came in and, and filled the void there. They have a longer life cycle than, than our other cotton insects. They live up to around 30 days as an immature and then another 30 or more days as an adult, which is a stage that does most of the damage, but the immatures can do damage as well. Uh, so if you think about that, if you they, they can be in the field for a long time doing damage if insecticide applications are not made uh, when, when needed. They overwinter as adults. Uh, they they uh, feed on, on clovers, wheat, uh, things like that in the spring. Uh, then generally they move to corn and they turn over a generation in corn before moving to cotton. Uh, depending on what part of the, the uh, country you're in, they also can go to peanuts, pecans. Uh, they'll move into soybean fields as they begin to put on pods and develop seed. Uh, and when we talk about stink bugs, there are several species that we can find. And, and uh, sometimes it's important to know which species we're dealing with, sometimes uh, least less so. So the first two here in the orange circles, you see uh, the first uh, stink bug there is the green stink bug. In the middle is the southern green stink bug. Now, Although the southern green may be a little bit more aggressive of a feeder, uh, they're, they're treated the same, uh, the same insecticide uh, uh, type or classes provide a similar control of each species, but it is important to know which one you're dealing with. The green stink bug, if you look at the antenna, it has alternating uh, light and, and black bands on the antenna. You see the southern green in the middle, it's got alternating more reddish and white bands on its antenna. So uh, important to be able to distinguish the green and the southern green. We'll talk about uh, another one that, that is uh, pretty susceptible to most insecticides is the, the new invasive brown marmorated stink bug. This thing is, has uh, uh, been in the news a lot. It's the one that's in your house and and then your uh, screened in back porch and those types of things in the fall and in the spring as they're coming over winter and then leaving overwintering sites. Uh, its key characteristic are the white bands uh, or alternating stripes along its, uh, its abdomen uh, behind the wings there and then also on the legs. That's how we tell it apart from the brown stink bug. Uh, it can be a little bit more damaging, particularly on older bowls than the other stink bug species are. So that's something else to consider with the brown marmorated stink bug. And then lastly, we'll talk about the brown stink bug and the leaf footed bug, which is not a stink bug, but we consider it as one in our, uh, our damage complex because it does very uh, similar damage. Now, the thing that make these uh, important to pull out compared to the other two is they are uh, appear to be less susceptible to pyrethroid insecticides. Uh, so if we've got a, a high percentage of the population is brown stink bugs or leaf footed bugs, we generally recommend organophosphate insecticides, whereas the other ones, uh, pyrethroids provide good control. Now, if you're just finding some, but most of what you're dealing with are the green stink bug species or the brown marmorated, you're probably okay with a, a pyrethroid, but if a large percentage or the brown or the leaf-footed bug, that, that may change your insecticide decision. So as far as scouting for stink bugs, how are we doing? Uh, you know, what's our, are we using a drop cloth? Are we using a sweep net? How are we sampling? Well, these tools can be used as detection methods, but these are, are not the best way to actually sample for stink bugs. Uh, they're very skittish insects. They're hard to collect on a drop cloth. They'll hear you coming. Uh, sometimes they'll even see your shadow and, and run up from you, so it's it's hard to sneak up on them. The best way to scout to scout for stink bugs is to actually look for and quantify their damage. So don't, don't try to actually look for the the bugs themselves. Look for the symptoms of the injury. So stink bugs are seed feeders by nature. Uh, they're they're targeting uh, bowls. Uh, they really seem to prefer bowls that are around 10 to 12 days old. So those are about an inch in diameter or about uh, as big around as a quarter. Uh, those are the bowls they really prefer to feed on. They're trying to, to feed on those developing seeds. So sometimes we'll see stained lint. Sometimes we'll see uh, warts develop, uh, as you see in, in these images here. Another image here uh, showing where you can see these uh, dark spots 
on the inside of the bowl wall where maybe a wart hasn't formed. It may form, it may not form. Uh, but even if it doesn't, that's still an, uh, an avenue for bull rot organisms to get inside and, and lose, cause losses that way. So we still would consider that injury or damage if we saw it. You also see a, a cross section there of a bowl uh, cut open, uh, a, a pretty mature bowl. And uh, what you notice is really only one lock there is damaged. And sometimes that happens where you, you don't lose the whole bowl. You just lose, you know, one, one lock of it. But we still would consider that uh, damage. We don't want to lose any of this cotton to stink bugs. And here's just an image uh, on our research farm in central Alabama to show uh, a block of cotton where uh, stink bugs were treated for and where they were not treated for. So it's pretty easy to see the damage potential these insects have. So as far as our decision aid, you know, what are we, uh, what, how do we sampling for stink bugs? Uh, what we recommend to do is, is pull a random sample of these quarter size, or again, one inch in diameter bowls that are approximately 10 to 12 days old. Don't pull them all from field borders. Uh, stink bugs are, are, they tend to infest borders heavily first and then slowly move across the field. So it's important to, to take representative samples from across the field to, to know what the pressure truly is in that individual field. Uh, pull at least one bowl per acre, but a minimum of, of 15 to 20 bowls per field to give a good idea of, of uh, you know, a good enough sample size. So you see these, these outside sunken lesions on the outside of the bowl. And that not always, but a lot of times that is uh, an indication of, of stink bug feeding. So what we recommend is start with those bowls first. Our thresholds are, are based on uh, percent, uh, percent internal damage. So if I pull 20 bowls and, and we'll just say in, in, in Alabama, our threshold the third week of bloom is 10% internal damage. So if I pull 20 bowls and the first two or three I look at have stink bug damage, I don't need to sample the rest of the bowls, right? Because I've already exceeded that threshold. Uh, so we try to start with bowls that we think are more likely to show damage so we can make our decision quicker. However, just because a bowl has those sucking lesions doesn't mean it will be damaged. And if it doesn't have those sucking lesions, doesn't mean it won't be damaged. So you do need to sample bowls um, to, to make sure that you're you're properly identifying injury. And then lastly, you know, smaller fields tend to be at higher risk than larger fields in our observations. As I mentioned, stink bugs are, are they initially infest borders or kind of weak or lazy flyers. Uh, if you think about a smaller field tends to have more of a border, uh, so they can be more easily uh, infested across that field. Or if you have a two, three, 400 acre field, it's going to take them a lot longer to move across that field. But stink bugs are a pest that are they're not difficult to control. They're really not difficult to scout for, but they have uh, really a high uh, damage potential if left untreated at, at threshold levels. So my take home points, uh, you know, cotton insect management is different from all other aspects of crop production. You know, our situation changes from week to week, sometimes field to field. Uh, you know, with, with some parts of crop production, you can sit down with a calendar and, and determine when you're going to make uh, certain applications or things, but insects just don't, don't behave that way. Uh, we have to be in the field every week, scouting, observing, looking for insects. Uh, I talked about a couple, but there's 12 or more damaging insect species that may be in the field uh, throughout the season. So proper monitoring, identification, and scouting is critical uh, for maximizing your grower's profitability. And again, just a reminder to refer to your state uh, extension for recommended thresholds uh, in, in your region and area. So with that, my, my contact information, if anybody has any questions or comments, I would be glad to, uh, to uh, take them. If not, I uh, hope this presentation has helped. Thank you.